Okay, so see what we're not gonna do here is judge me. Okay, let's let's not do that. Hello, my name is Margaret Adele, and I'm giving up. Kind of. I am not doing my Roll for TBR game for the month of September. I fell into, careened really, into a slump for August. It was just, it was so bad. Um, <laughs> I mentioned in my 24-hour readathon video that I get a weird kind of time blindness when it comes to the month of August because I work in education and we go back to school at the end of August. And so my brain wants to start preparing to go back to school like the second August 1st hits. You know, everything else that I'd planned to do over the summer, even from, you know, getting my wisdom teeth taken out to family coming over to the Ren Fair trip. It all happened in June and July. So for my brain, there was no other summary things going on in August. So August was a month to go back to school. But I'm a para, not a teacher. So I don't even have like a room to prep. So I had three weeks of nothing, but I could not convince my brain to do any of the summary goal things that I wanted to do. And that includes reading. I was so determined that August was going to be the month where I beat uh, my yearly reading goal, which is 100 books, which I always beat it in fall, somewhere thereabouts, but I was going to beat it earlier this year. I was going to get all of my books on my TBR read, and I was going to read enough to get down to the 50 books on my TBR challenge. It was going to be so great, awesome, and I could not make it work. I tried. <laughs> so hard. I did a 24-hour readathon, which helped a little bit. I did audiobooks, which can sometimes help when things are getting slumpy, but nothing worked. Even books that I knew I was interested in just couldn't, couldn't work it. And then I started putting together my Pop Sugar Reading Challenge uh, for the rest of the year, the, the slots that I still need to fill, and I was way more interested in that than anything I had on my TBR, but I still had to keep reading to get the TBR lowered and I didn't, I did not want to unhaul the rest of the way there because that felt cheap and it was just, was not working. By the time I finally gave up, I was three books away from beating my monthly TBR goal and already partially the way through two of those books and I was like two books away from hitting a hundred and it was just, it wasn't working. So I, I said, fuck it. I let myself fall into a slump, ironically, just around the time that the school year started. So I actually had a lot more mental space to focus on the beginning of the school year rather than reading. And uh, I did unhaul. I, I knew I, I had other physical books. I'm, I've been so hesitant to unhaul the physical books for my TBR challenge because I have to actually go and take them to a place. But uh, I had enough that I didn't want and I knew I didn't want. So I could unhaul those. I finally got down to 50. So it was a little bit of a hollow victory but after a year and a half I have beat my TBR challenge we have taken 380 books off the TBR and are down to 50 so now what that means is I am switching to a maintaining the TBR challenge which is just a simple one in one out I read or unhaul a book I get a new book and that's it uh, maybe if I really feel inspired in the month month year of 2024 maybe then I can try for like a full lower it even further to 25 or whatever but I'm not gonna push it at this point I'm so burnt out with that challenge that as proud as I am of myself I am also really glad it's done now we are going to talk a little bit about the books I did read in August and what I'm going to read in September, but it is not going to be a formal rolling and letting the random picks of the dice choose because that game was meant to serve a purpose of helping me pick when I couldn't pick. But right now I have several lists of books that I want to work on. Therefore, the random nature of the dice are going to be working against me. And especially with this time of year, when I am coming up on the time when I close to review requests. I really need to get uh, very strict in how I prioritize certain things so that I don't leave a lot of review books on the table or review requests on the table when I close at the end of October. So first things first, what did I read in August? 
All right, so first up, we have Bewitching the Elements by Gabriella Hurstick. This is a nonfiction all about uh, paganism, witchcraft, New Age, spiritualism, all of that good stuff. And uh, I knew going in that I wasn't going to get too much out of this because I am more pagan than witchcraft, so I don't want to do like actual spell work. Um, but I found this at a thrift store, aka the thrift store that I am giving all of my unhauled books too that I have so much store credit at. So I'm like, yeah, you know, I've been looking for a book like this. So I went for it and I did find at least a couple good ideas for my daily practice that I like and have helped. And when you're working with mentally ill children with anger issues for a job, any kind of methods that help bring your mind back to level is very nice. Uh, however, there was a kind of like low key vibe a kind of look how special we are because of our spiritual beliefs thing and I'm not the biggest fan of that idea mostly because that's very much a Christian thing and not in a good way uh, I don't really want the idea of believing a certain thing makes you better than anyone else I'm over it I don't need it anymore uh, so that was a little bit weird and also I don't get it. They did a thing where the author spelled women with an X instead of an E. I, f I know that's supposed to denote something, but I, I don't understand why. Like, that, randomly adding an X to something meant to be, like, gender inclusive, but to words that either already were gender inclusive or are meant to not be gender inclusive. Like, it is meant to be specifically women and I'm pretty sure most people who identify as non-binary would not want to be called a woman even with an X. So like, I don't know. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work. That's still, I can't quite understand that one. Uh, but regardless, I did get some stuff from this. So it did its purpose and I have a few more notes in my journal for it. So yay. Up next, we have Rescued by the Married Monster Hunters by Enos Rook Bash. This is a polycule monster romance about a monster who is living in like a interdimensional video gamey dungeon and through plot ends up befriending a hunter from the upper world and then the hunter dies and then Vessel ends up being turned in to look like the hunter and the horrible things happen and then the titular married monster hunters rescue them. And then romance ensues, but Vessel is pretending to be this hunter, so it's like big tension, what it's going to happen when they find out kind of thing. I liked the idea of the tension, um, and I also liked the world building with the hunters. In this world, uh, the hunters are majority disabled because the cairns in which they are trained, uh, basically, they will take in any sick child uh, who cannot be saved by the rest of the medicine world and save them with magic. But the trade-off is they now have to become hunters. It is essentially you have to work for the magic that keeps you going. And it's not a cure. It's basically like like regular use medicine, but just magic instead of like pills or whatever. Uh, so I liked that idea. Um, and I kind of liked the dynamic of the polycule. There was just... It, it was too fast, which is something I say a lot. I am a slow burn girly. I recognize that about myself. And this book was not under my 200 page limit, but it was not very far beyond it. And the problem was, is that the world building was kind of wishy-washy in a lot of ways. Like at one point, uh, Vessel is saying something to the effect of, all monsters know that uh, humans are just herd cattle and you shouldn't feel bad about eating them because they're just herd cattle. And then later on, it's like, oh no, humans are actually the evil ones and we were all taught that and they're the ones hurting us and they're the masterminds. And it's like, okay, are humans evil masterminds to monsters or are they herd cattle? Like you can't, you can't be both. Uh, so it was a little bit confusing. And also it did the thing where the entire status quo of the world is different by the end of the book and it's not very long. If you want the entire status quo, the entire culture of a place to go from distinctly one thing to distinctly another thing, you have to put in a lot of work for it to feel like it's actually going to last and not just a fluke thing in that one place. Like I didn't quite feel that, oh, everything is better now. They've learned. I, 
it, it felt too rushed. But again, I am a slow burn girly in, in most things. Although I kind of would have just preferred if there had been more focus on just the romance. Uh, still, it, it was a nice tale. And I think uh, most people who like monster romances will probably enjoy this one. Up next was the only review book. I read in August, and that is Changelings, an autistic trans anthology. This is a self-published freelance anthology not attached to any specific press by the editors uh, Ocean Riley and Ryan Vale. I was sent it by uh, A.R. Vale because I had reviewed their work in a different identity-based anthology, and these kind of anthologies are not unknown to me. However, most of the time they aren't just about the identity. Like the one that I've been published in was sapphic romances in nautical settings and usually speculative. And the one that one of the editors was published in was trans voices in horror. There's usually a level of curation beyond just the identity and this one didn't have that and you could tell it ran the gambit of all kinds of genres and it kind of read like a a little bit like a whiplash because you'd have the cutesiest, not at all speculative uh, high school romance next to body horror, next to space opera battles. Like it, it was a lot to take in and it wasn't curated in such a way as to make it like a, an arc, so to speak. Like we start with the completely contemporary and then move into the more heavier stuff. So I would have liked a little bit more curation with it. Um, for some reason, my brain decided that it really liked the cutesy contemporary stuff, which is weird. I usually go for the weird stuff. But in general, this anthology had very grandiose ideas of what it was going to be. And I think it was too grandiose. Uh, based on the Kickstarter, it was supposed to be like the big representation for all trans autistic people, which is always going to be impossible, literally impossible to do because no group is a monolith. And they got a lot of flack for it because people pointed out like, hey, there's not even any trans femme voices in here. Like you're trying to make it uh, a slice of the, the monolith, but you're not even including this whole section. And someone else noted, I do not know if this is true, but someone else said that all the authors are white. I don't know, but if that is true, then that again means it's not the best spread of it. And it looks like they have changed the uh, snippet and the synopsis and everything on Goodreads because originally they had just copied it over from Kickstarter and it had a way hinkier vibe on Goodreads than it would have on Kickstarter. But in general, I do wish that both the anthology and some of the stories in it had aimed for much more attainable goals than impossible goals. Uh, but there are some great stories in it. Um, I did appreciate, again, a lot of the cutesier stuff. Um, it, it, it did do the thing I don't like, which is when people put short stories from bigger series in an anthology. And that's just because my brain translates a uh, short story from a bigger book as you should subscribe to this newsletter or you should buy this book. Like it, it inherently reads as an advertisement for that other work more than it feels like a standalone piece of media in itself. And I think I'm not alone in this because the other reviews I was looking at, there was one story in particular that everyone was just so confused by because the sheer amount of world building you would need to understand it wasn't done because it was obviously done in the book that it's from. So not my favorite, but there were some great, great stories in there and some authors that I am definitely going to look a little bit more into and see what else they've done. So up next was the prompt uh, science fiction. And I originally picked a trial and error by Oleander Bloom for this one. But I DNF'd. I tried I tried. I was reading it in 50 page increments trying to make it work, but there was just so much horribleness going on to this character so often that even reading it in 50 pages, I felt bad after I would get to the end of that 50 pages. And I, I mentioned it in that readathon video and the author was like, hey, I'm gonna give you a heads up. Uh, it doesn't get better. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were like, you know, do you want me to just spoil it for you? I said, yeah, sure. I don't mind being spoiled on stuff. And they revealed the rest of that book and the next book to me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I can't. No. Um, now, it is done with a purpose in this book. Uh, however, 
it just it's the pacing is too much it's asking way too much of an emotional tax from a reader with no payoff until the end of book three like that's that's too much you got to give you got to give your readers a little bit of levity and also despite the fact that it is science fiction there's very little to do with the dimension hopping clown people and everything to do with the very real trauma like the majority of the story and the conflicts is about the real world trauma with just some light dimension hopping as a side plot which is not necessarily what you want when you pick up a sci-fi um so put this one to the side I already informed the author that I will not be reviewing and it sucks but like I'm already in a weird place <laughs> so don't need to jeopardize it with more of that um, but if you like super dark stuff with some light sci-fi added in, um, you can definitely check out the Caring for Your Clown series. But instead, what I did was some, admittedly still pretty dark, but not quite as dark <laughs> sci-fi that I replaced it with, because at this time I was still going for a win, so I'm like, oh, I'll do a dirty one, that's fine. And so I read The Giver by Lois Lowry. I um, had this one on my pop sugar challenge because I needed a book that was published the year I was born and I was born in 1993 and of course this one is a classic uh, apparently the movie isn't that great but it holds up and I read it and oh my god like some of those scenes like and this one is deceptive because it goes on with like the the happy-go-lucky community for so long like you're you almost start to like genuinely believe like you know something is supposed to be wrong right because you know dystopian anti-utopian whatever but like it does such a good job of writing things out and then when you actually get to the limit of what's going on behind the scenes and you see things and oh my god the scene where Jonah asks his parents if they love him and they don't even realize that their response is shattering his heart because they don't understand what love even is <sighs> like un unexpectedly bad for my heart uh but I did love it. It was great. And I also realized after the fact, I actually have read another in this series. But like the book I read, which is Gathering Blue, was so wholly separate. Like, it, I don't know, like it didn't even occur to me that they were connected because Gathering Blue is such a different vibe. So <laughs> I have read another book in this series, but it does not continue off directly after this one. Um, and I don't know that I'm going to continue with the series after that. I haven't decided yet. But in general, I am very much a fan of this one. <laughs> Up next, we had Rock Hard Gargoyle by Maggie Mayhem. This was a random monster romance pick that I picked at random. That was redundant. Regardless, this is all about a woman falling in love with a gargoyle who is a security officer because she is being stalked and things go on. And again, same thing was too short. I needed so much more. I needed a lot more descriptions of the world building because it feels like it kind of just throws things together. It didn't really build up the big bad all that much. So even though it had a big scene confronting the big bad, it didn't feel as impactful as I wanted it to because again, it had been so short and I realized, I realized, I realized the monster romances as a whole tend to be short. Actually, they tend to be extremes because it's either they are a novella or a book that just barely breaks 200 pages or they're like 500 to 600 pages. <laughs> there's, there's very rarely a happy medium in monster romances for whatever reason. Uh, but I will not be continuing with this series in particular, um, but I probably will be including it on that next big monster romance rec list whenever I get to that one. <laughs> Up next was probably my favorite book of the month, and that was Rigoru by S.J. Sanders. This is a uh, book in the same world as their book Red, which was basically a monster romance polycule version of Red Riding Hood. And in that world, we see a much farther along society where humans are basically living in medieval-esque encampments, villages style stuff with very puritanical views. And uh, there are these creatures called the Rigoru that are basically like giant wolf people 
and there are uh, triads of males going around because they mate in triads and all the humans are scared of them. And this one was surprising because this one is a prequel taking place like decades, if not centuries before that one. And you actually find out, I love this, that it's not Earth they're on. They're on an entirely different planet. That's not like a big reveal from the end. Like that's early on in the book uh, that both humans and the Rogoru were transported to this planet from dying homeworlds. And it was really interesting to see the setup for how this sci-fi futuristic tech human society was going to start crumbling and turning into the backwards puritanical society we saw in um, Red. So I was really happy with that. I was really excited by that idea. And I really like the concept because also those two books now function as book ends. You have uh, Rigoru as the origin story and Red as uh, the one that kind of wraps it up and, and changes things for the better for the society. Again, that status quo is changed by the end of that, but that book is much longer. So it worked. And you already saw like some inklings that other humans and other people were actually on board with changing the status quo. And it looks like the author is going to continue writing in this world, but all future books are going to take place within the parameters. Like they will be separate. You will be able to read them without having to know the entire setup because they are not direct sequels to each other. But basically we're going to see, I believe the author said like the descendants of the book, uh, Rigoru book uh, characters living their lives throughout the course of this dark time for people. And so there will come a day when you could read like from Rigoru to Red. And I like that idea. I like the idea of this, this series that has spread across generations and generations on this alien planet, watching and mapping how certain things developed over the course of that time. I love like macro world building in my sci-fi romances. It's so good. Um, so I will be on the lookout for the next time one of those comes out. I believe this one was published not too long ago, so I'll probably be waiting for a hot minute, but that's fine. I can be patient. And in case you're worrying, no, I did not just leave someone standing at the door. My husband is also here. <laughs> so what am I going to be reading in September? I am not rolling for a TBR this time around, and neither am I coming up with a strict list to follow on my own. I am still kind of like slumpy. I'm not very far away from the reading slump yet, so I don't want to push myself right back into it. Um, however, there are still some things that I want to accomplish with my reading. So rather than having a strict list, I'm going to have like three areas of focus for what I want my reading to be. And that is just to help me pick what I want to read next. I am still going to be maintaining my TBR, which means I will have to read one new book before I can get one new one. Uh, but in general, I am not going to be putting a lot of work into choosing specific titles. And I am instead going to let my brain kind of gravitate towards what it wants to within the areas that I have picked. Area number one is uh, nonfiction library books. Mostly because I have discovered that nonfiction books, especially when they are about more lighthearted topics, is a great way for me to get out of a slump and stay out of it. Um, before when I got into a reading slump, I remember I read a pop science book about how to get better sleep. And this last time I read a book from the library about uh, the memoir of a curator from the Museum of Sex in New York. That was fun. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on that. I do have um, some ideas of stuff to get in mind. I am still researching pagan stuff. So I've always got that. But uh, having books with low emotional impact can really help when I'm feeling slumpy because in a lot of cases I don't want to read about people going through horrible things right now even though I know they'll win in the end I just don't want the emotional roller coaster and nonfiction helps with that I just got to pick you know not really dark historical books in those instances but another area is uh, pop sugar books the pop sugar reading challenge is done by the lifestyle brand pop sugar and it is probably the most popular thing they do i think it outshines like the rest of their brand and i actually won it for the first time last year and so i want to go for two times in a row the thing is though is that i am down to the wire with a lot of these prompts because i am getting to the point where it's like i have to search out the specific things i can't just read what i was already going to read and see what fits because it's like i have to read a 
celebrity memoir, or, you know, a, a book that won that specific award or was published a specific year, what have you. So in a lot of instances coming up, I just have to actually start picking out books specifically, but I am really excited for it. I've got some great picks and I am really feeling energized about those picks. So I am going to go to that list when I need to get new books and see what's on there for me to pick. Super excited about that. And then the third one is of course, as it always is, review books. Technically, I'm sitting pretty well with review books right now. There's only six on my list, which is ridiculously low for me. Usually if I can get down to five, I'm cheering myself on. But this is mostly because I have a decent amount of unanswered review requests sitting in my inbox. At least four off the top of my head. So... <laughs> I gotta get some work done. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta start taking out those review books and getting them taken care of. And I'm really excited about them. I got some good ones on there. I, I do have high fantasy, but it's gay high fantasy. So it's fine. It doesn't count. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, um, high fantasy is my struggle genre. The genre I struggle with the most. But if you make it gay... I struggle a whole lot less. It's the gay loophole. I love it. Uh, <laughs> regardless, there are a lot of fun stuff, a lot of fun books on there that I want to get to. Um, but it is imperative that I get all those review requests answered in one way or another and get my review list down pretty decently low because I close to all review requests, hard close, at the end of uh, October. Basically, November 1st is when I'm completely done. And the point of that is I don't review books very often throughout November and December. If you've never worked in an elementary school, December is a particularly hellish month to work in an elementary school because the children are done <laughs> mentally. They are just gone. <laughs> they are ready for Christmas. They see it on the horizon. All the fun stuff is happening. They are so ready for Christmas break. <laughs> And most of the time you're like limping to the end goal. <laughs> you're like, just get there, just get there. And then you come back in the new year and you're refreshed. But that, that limping to Christmas is... <laughs> Um, so I don't want to have added pressures of review books for either November or December. And I can focus on the holiday stuff. Um, but I am going to challenge myself to be really hard and fast about closing to review books this time. I've done a really good job lately of making sure that no one has access to my email outside of the review policy and the review policy keeps up to date of whether I am open or closed because it is a living document. I mean, it's literally just a Google Doc. So I go in and type, you know, currently closed. So I'm going to try to stick to that and be like, I am not going to respond to any emails sent between November 1st and January 1st. So... I'm going to feel like a bad person because it means that someone's going to either not necessarily know they find my email through some long buried source or they just shoot for it anyway and they send me an email and I'm going to be like hard nope maybe I'll create like a copy and paste message to be like send it again in the new year I'm not reading it right now or what have you um because a lot of cases I would be like oh I'll leave it for now and then just read it in the new year and then it would get lost in the shuffle in my inbox so I'm going to be I'm going to try really hard about it. I do not, do not accept review requests for the most part. For the most part. I actually, I'm changing that now <laughs> because some of like the authors that I love who I would want the next review book of will look at that and be like, oh, I shouldn't send it. But like, y'all don't count. But I also don't know how to explain to authors who it, it is that, that doesn't count and can still send me books even when I'm closed. <laughs> like do I do I send them an email informing them that like every time I say I'm closed you don't that doesn't apply to you don't worry about it <laughs> I don't know anyway um, I'm going to try and work on tackling those review books a lot more in uh, September and October get it really low get everything accepted or rejected by the end of October so that I can go into my closed period with 
not a zero list but a low list and I can focus on the holidays and also you know the reindeer readathon in December that I always love doing and the pop sugar stuff like just focusing on other stuff to finish out the year um but yes that is what I'm going to be doing I don't know how well September is gonna go on one hand I have like three three-day weekends for myself well I mean one of them is a, a PD day but like a professional development day is way less stressful than a regular school day um but I also have concerts and ren fairs and all that kind of stuff to go to so I got no clue I have no clue how my reading is gonna go I hope I can tackle a lot of review and pop sugar books I hope I can come back maybe to the TBR game in October uh I just wanted to get to 10 books. That was my goal. I need to get to 10 books on the challenge. We'll see how that goes. Regardless, thank you so much for listening to all of my rambling. Have you picked what you're going to read for September? Are you winging it? Have you ever had to give up on a TBR game because it just wasn't vibing with your brain at the moment? Please let me know down in the comments below. And with nothing else to say, I hope you have a wonderful day and a marvelous tomorrow.